So, in turn, <coughs> I woke up this morning and looked at my mom and said, do I have to go to church today? <laughs> Can we just skip it? I mean, it's not like I'm preaching or anything today. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> I also woke up today with a tickle in my throat, so bear with me. Isn't it funny how we take something so simple for granted? Take water, for example. As we continue through the message today, I'd like you to think about these few things. Water is about 60 to 70% of your body mass. 80% of your brain matter is made of water. And you can only go three to five days without it, and you'll die. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly <coughs> Father, I thank you for this day that we can all gather together and learn and worship about you. Pray for strength. I try to convey your message to people that so rightfully deserve it. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the fact that we can all gather together here to worship me. Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, the passage today is John 4, sorry Cindy, it's John 4, 9 through 30. I have neglected to tell her that. It was actually after practicing and was like, oh, I have to read verse 9. So, it's the story of Jesus at the well talking to a Samaritan woman. Uh, this well is actually addressed as Jacob's well. The fun fact about this is you can actually hop on a plane and go to this place and go to Jacob's well. And I direct myself over here. I imagine there's a well here. So whenever I go like this, there's a well here. So people go to this place and actually say, wow, I know exactly what happened here. So now there's a fun fact about this place. Um, I would ask if anybody doesn't know this story, it kind of be redundant for me to stand up in front of you, though. And to recap the story and then turn around and preach about it. Because if it was that easy, I'd recap and about three minutes later, we'd go home. So, let's read John 4, 9 and 10. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. <coughs> Verse 9 is a question addressed to Jesus. I want to focus on his answer. Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Let's break this down. What does this all mean? If you knew the gift of God. So, this main point that I want to illustrate is that John portrays to us, the reader, that we look at this and the Samaritan woman does not know anything about this faith, about the Jews and their side of town. So, if you only knew the gift of God. So she's not aware of what is happening. And who it is that asked you for a drink? Well, that kind of makes sense. If she doesn't know the whole subject matter, she doesn't know who it is that's speaking to her. If she only knew it was Jesus talking to her, she would have asked him. Instead of Jesus coming to her, he's just like, if you would have known who I am, you would have found me out and asked for this drink, which is referred to as living water. <coughs> <coughs> Told you it was 
going to be annoying. Uh, let's take a look at verses 13 and 14. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water, referring to the well, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up in eternal life. In that passage, Jesus not only goes back to the statement of his gift of living water, but he also goes to, he addresses the fact that she's here at this well getting water. He makes a clear contrast between living water and what I like to call worldly water. What's the contrast? Well, worldly water has the ability to quench your thirst, but not for long. George, have you ever taken a drink of water? Yeah, I'm pretty sure all of us have been there. Have you ever, after drinking it over a period of time, been thirsty again. Yeah. Yes, I'm pretty sure we've all been there. I'm pretty sure we've thirsted at least once in our lives. So, that's something that we can't expect to drink water and then turn around and never be thirsty again. But Jesus says, he who drinks this water will never thirst. Jacob's well was a meeting place for people to come, fill their pot, or jar, or whatever they went to fill it with, go home, use it, run out of water, and come back. And they do this every day. So this woman is thinking about, whoa, if you're offering me water that I don't have to keep coming back here to this well, maybe this guy knows what he's talking about. Another distinction between living water and worldly water is that I have actually written down here that worldly water has the ability to renew your mind, but not permanently. Let me illustrate on this. What is the medical condition for lack of water? Dehydration. Dehydration. And how do you come back from dehydration? Good job. And so I was hoping it'd go this way. So, <laughs> so um, once you once you're dehydrated, a, a side effect of dehydration is delusions and and clouded thoughts, clouded thinking. We go back to what George said. Once I drink, there's always that chance that I'm going to fall back in dehydration. And in fact, if you don't drink again, obviously you're going to get dehydrated again. So you always have that fallback unless if you keep drinking this worldly water, like H2O we're talking about, you're going to have that symptom. Now this is the part where the elders laugh at me because I neglected to mark my Bible where I wanted to flip to. So. Romans 12, 2. See, I can flip it. You guys can flip it. We'll be there at the same time. It says, Do not conform any longer with the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Once you've made that choice, you have that renewal of your mind that says, I'm put on this earth to obey God's commands, praise Him, and tell others. I am constantly, well not constantly, but I'm focused on the fact that this is why I'm here. My mind is not clouded, I'm here for a reason. That's to clarify the renewal aspect of living versus worldly water. Revelation 21.6. Oh, my new kid that didn't mark his Bible. See, you laugh. <laughs> Revelation 21.6. This, when 
I found this, I was completely amazed. This was really a cool thing that happened to me. This is John, okay? Revelation, this is Revelation. John 21, 6. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the water, from the spring of the water of life. God spoke to John in a time frame that was completely different from when this aspect happened. Do you see what just happened there? God spoke to John about a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And Jesus mentions the same thing in verse 14. It took one topic from one completely separate part of the Bible and another part or another book of the Bible was the same thing and when this happened to me it was like wow because it's not like this is how the Last Supper happened or this is how the Last Supper happened or this is how the Last Supper happened it was one topic being spoken about in John and another topic said by God in Revelation it's just a cool experience for me to to witness that. But God speaks to John about this same water. Oh, he's on the second page. Funny thing about liquids. They're no use to us if they're not in a container. Really. I mean, take water... If you want to drink from water, you need something to hold it. A cup, a jar, a bowl. Some people tell me, well, well I, was, I was talking to people about this, and when I got to this part of my sermon, they were like, well, what about a stream or a river? Well, look at a river. And you have a bank, a bank, and a bottle. It's still a device that is able to hold other things. And the Bible describes the body as a vessel, which is an object that is capable of holding other things. So in turn, a cup is a vessel. So from now on, when I mention the cup, it's also referring to your physical body, which has the ability to hold other things. Life is both spiritual and material. I believe that there has to be a balance of both. You can't live fully in the spiritual. Oh my gosh, the guy made a pretty bold statement. There is only one person on this entire earth that lived an entire life fully in the spiritual. Because we're not perfect. That's the reason why we can't live in the spiritual. We can't fully live in the material because look at the parable of the lost son. He went away, lived in the material, found out it wasn't good enough, it didn't fill him up. Maybe this woman felt the same way. I felt the same way. After living fully in the material, at the end of the day, your body gets pretty beaten up. Oh my gosh. A lot more than what I want to take out. But at the end of the day, your cup kind of gets beat up. And after a while of living in the material, you get beaten down. I was there. I was living a life in which I was in the spiritual and, and the material. That got balanced. But also, Something happened, and I decided that my faith wasn't as strong as what I thought it was. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm here now. But I felt beat up after every day. Every single day. I can honestly say in that time frame of which I turned 
not completely, but didn't 100% focus my life on God, every day I felt a little more crushed. What you put in your cup at the end of the day determines how you feel at the end of the day. Maybe this woman longed for the fact that she wasn't going to be crushed at the end of the day. As illustrated in John 4, 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and keep coming here to draw water. She went to this well every day. She's still thinking that Jesus is just talking about <coughs> water. Her lifestyle has been home, well, home, well, home, well, every day. So she longs for a change. She longs for a different lifestyle. John 4, 16. In my mind, it's probably the funniest verse in this passage. He told her, go call your husband and come back. Okay. So if you don't get what I'm trying to tell you, call your husband and come back. Because, of course... People who've read this already know what happens in 17 and 18. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands. The fact is, ooh, read the same line twice. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you just said is quite true. Can you imagine what this woman felt at this well? She's here drawing the same water for the past years and years and years. She's been able to hold a pot and go to this well. And this mystery man comes up to her and says, <laughs> You've had five husbands, and the guy that you're with now isn't one of them. I can imagine that this was a secret, that this was a process in which she wanted to keep to herself. And so this man that she doesn't know does that to her. It's kind of like fire at the gas station, filling up the car. And this random stranger walks up to me and says, your total is 30 $450, and I'm halfway done. Let's talk about your bank account your social life, your job. And by the way, I know all of this. You don't have to talk to me. It was just completely bizarre because it's completely out of the norm. She has no idea who this man really is. This can be a sermon all in itself, John 4, 19 through 26. But if I wanted to make it a sermon, I'd be talking about that. So I'm going to read this. Then there's a lot here, but I want to really focus on one point. Verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. You get that kind of uh, worship. But this is what I want to focus on. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Collecting myself. 
Remember when I told you in the beginning that John sort of leads the reader on to the fact that this woman does not know anything about this? About who Jesus is and where he comes from and what his background is? It says in verse 19, Sir, the woman said, I can see you are a prophet. All right. So I know what you stand for. I know your side of town. You're, you're one of those people. You're a prophet. And she goes from that to, in verse 25, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. This is after Jesus tries to explain to her all these things about worship. And she replies, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. So not only do I know about you people, I know this one person is coming. And by the way, when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. So I have questions I have to ask him. So when he comes, I'll talk to him. But not you, because you're just a prophet. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Now, think of this from the woman's aspect. He went from random stranger to a prophet to now the guy that she's wanted to ask these questions to. Because she obviously wants to. Because then she wouldn't have said when he comes to explain everything to us. If she didn't have questions, she wouldn't have cared. This is what happens to a lot of people that are on the fence about deciding whether they want to turn and be a part of God's army. I can stay on that fence and wait for him to come. Or I can just ask. You know why? Because through all this conversation at this well, he was in front of her the entire time. He's there the entire time. All you got to do is ask. People that are on the fence about this sometimes need maybe a fellow Christian friend or some sign or some divine power to say, look, this is, this is the lifestyle we need to live. But what gets me is that all they got to do is ask because Jesus is right there. There is a very wise man that I hold in the highest regard. And I told him I'm going to speak of this. I told him the story and I told him where it was in the Bible and he sat me down and he's like, get a Bible. Open up to verse 28. Because if you don't read 28 and if you don't make a point about it, everything that you've said is for nothing. Verses 28 and 29. Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who has told me everything I have ever did. Could this be the Christ? Why was she at the well? She's there to fill up her jar. She had an encounter from somebody that could give her so much more. And so everything, the whole purpose of why she was there, her lifestyle of going back and forth, she left her jar. If the whole purpose about this is four words. Leaving her water jar. <laughs> she left it. That was the whole reason why she's there. Until she found somebody else that could give her so much more, and she's like, I'm done. I got this. I'm going into town and telling it <laughs> all my friends, because this guy is the real deal.
because not everybody has to stand up here and preach. Not everybody has to volunteer and say, oh, I'm just filling my duty coming up here. You can go out and impact other people through the life that you live. <laughs> it's simple as that. As Christians, we are obligated to reach out, but we should go out with our suits on every day, with a Bible saying, hey, read this, hey, hey, hey. Because you shouldn't act like that. You should be humble. Because this is a gift of what we're doing. We don't deserve this. Mark 16, 15, and 16. go into the world and preach all the good news to all creation. Whoever believes will be back and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. That's Jesus talking. That sounds like to me, if you're aware, if you've accepted, if you've taken that step, if you turn around and put what you need inside your cup, obligated to go out and do that. To touch other people. Because everybody deserves that chance to take a drink of what you're having. Oh, he sat me over here. Because <laughs> you're the only guy that knows what to say. <laughs> What's in this cup? Just take a guess. What's in this cup? Nothing. All right. So, what's inside this cup? Well, it's not good. It's just it's juice, man. <laughs> water in this cup. Did you send your I never said that there was water in here. I was just telling you all the fun facts about water. I never said there's water in this cup. People watch me drink. Well, well, what was in this cup? You can obviously see that there's great juice in here, but why? Why? <laughs> because it's made of styrofoam. You can't see what's inside. You just assume that there's something inside of you. I left a little because I figured George would help me out. Mm. Look where that got me. But, <laughs> this is styrofoam. Lots of Christians live a way in which we're like, well, except for the broken part. Lots of Christians live a way in which it's like, I'm a Christian, look at me. But I can I can put whatever I want in here, and you will never know. I can put that Christian smile on and say, Hello, welcome to our church. And then throughout the week, I can live in the material and nobody will know. So instead of living like this, live like this. Why? Because you know what's inside. If I live a life like this, I can be that loud and proud Christian that says, I believe in Christ. Look at me. And I'm not ashamed. People that look at Christians like this, that are on the fence, people that we should be helping, look at this and it's like, hmm, what separates them from me? Why is their life so much better? But if we live a life like this, there's no question. They have Christ in their lives. They're so much better. Maybe I want what they're having. That's my call 
to people in this church who I think is the majority. Live a life like this. So your co-workers, some people at school, so even your family members at home know what's inside. I call the people that are maybe that are here, ready to come out that door, ready to fill up with something that isn't helping to turn and to put the good stuff in your cup. So during this hymn that I asked George to come up and help me with, <laughs> I invite those people that are on the fence today to come up. And, and if you're too scared to come up in front of us, see me after worship. See an elder. See Dan. We're all here for you. And I just I can't believe I got through it. But um, thank you for this opportunity. Join in our and move. Let my bullet down there. 9 11 versus 1 and 4. Thank you. Oh. Thank you for your care and your love. We thank you for that and his message this morning. In Jesus' name.